Hello comic art fans, I'm Matt Kennedy and this is my crib. Let's go upstairs. Let's head into the bedroom. Now let's head into the comic art room. Well, here it is, the Sanctum Sanctorum. There's a lot of um, a lot of good comic art on the walls. I think I'm a huge collector of Bruno Redondo, and you'll see that on the far wall. But uh, first, let's go through some of the pieces on the north wall. So top left here, we've got uh, a commission I, I got from Bruno Redondo. Um, he is a predominantly digital artist, but I got him to do an analog piece of Nightwing in tribute to Daredevil 181. Um, of course, replacing Daredevil with Nightwing, um, Bullseye with the Joker, and Electro with uh, Barbara Gordon as Batgirl. There's, uh, um, I just found out this has got a high probability of becoming the cover to a Nightwing special, number one. So that was, I guess, my first art-directed cover for a comic book. Over here, of course, we've got a beautiful Ryan Otley tribute to both Wolverine number one and the Daredevil cover, of course, of No More Mr. Nice Guy, uh, both Frank Miller uh, comics, and a piece that I actually picked up on eBay. 
And when I acquired this, it became a very pivotal piece in changing how I collect things. Here you've got Howard Inks over Mazzucchelli Blue Line, a great, beautiful scene from Batman Year One, uh, in this case done as a double page splash as opposed to just a single um, frame on um, the top of a single page. And this piece I just picked up very recently, this is a beautiful Chris Wild Goose uh, Batgirl page. Uh, this is a double page splash. Um, just amazing. It's pencil on top of a blue line mechanical pencil. And I believe what they do is they do a contrast of the pencils the same way that Frank Quitely chooses to do a hard contrast on his 2H uh, graphite uh, pencils instead of doing actual inkings. But I just love the sense of motion and action in this piece. Another great commission. This, of course, is uh, Immortal Hulk and uh, Joe Bennett. And, um, you know, I had a, one of my favorite pieces of artwork in the history of comics is Fantastic Four number 51, This Man, This Monster. And so I had him do an Immortal Hulk version of this with Hulk as a thing, which is sort of timely, and um, having other characters uh, step in for the characters in the Fantastic Four, including the Harpy and, um, you know, the uh, Phosphorus Dude. And this, of course, needs very little explanation. Uh, most people recognize this as a wonderful tribute to X-Men, Uncanny X-Men number 141. This is Raul Fernandez tribute using the Generation X characters. Um, and again, I, I picked every single person on the poster and really gave um, a lot of direction on this and got it turned on very quickly. Uh, he was able to accomplish this in really, I think, less than two months and just a beautiful, beautiful piece. We all hope that we'll get a revival of that 90s Generation X team, and it'd be great if Fernandez could do it. He's a huge fan. So on the left here, you've got an original uh, standing signboard poster for Female Yakuza Tail. Um, in, my, in a previous life, uh, I was the president of Panic House Entertainment, and we released a lot of Pinky Violence films. I was largely responsible for bringing the Pinky Violence film from Japan to the United States for the very first time. And uh, this poster with uh, Reiko Ike, and a film directed by Chiro Ishii reflects the, um, the trading cards that um, form a gambling game in Japan, mainly in Yakuza-owned um, gambling houses, and it's just a pinnacally rare poster, but just a beautiful piece that exemplifies the entire genre. Um, many of the posters of the Pinky Violence films feature a ton of nudity, I didn't want to have a lot of nudity on my walls, and so I felt like this one really captured that element of what has been an important part of my career and even an important part of collecting moving forward. And as you look next to that, you're going to see top to bottom, a Christine Wu painting, a Mark Todd piece, a tribute to the Fantastic Four X-Men. And uh, next to that, uh, or bottom of that, I guess you should say, there's another Christine Wu. Wonderful illustrator from California, Taiwanese American. And then here from top to bottom, you've got a Bernie Wrightson Frankenstein title um, artwork. You know, one of my favorite pieces, Bernie Wrightson, always been one of my favorite artists. And then left to right here, you've got a Scott Hovey piece. It's a, um, a three-dimensional piece. Scott Hovey does a kind of cake decorating meets um, a little bit of taxidermy style. He's a museum exhibited artist, uh, quite famous um, internationally. Then an Alessia Ionetti piece, a, a sort of a child vampire. And then uh, on the right of that is a piece by Adnohia, um, which uh, very much uh, in the H.R. Giger style. And so both the Hove piece and the Adnohia piece were part of the Coaster Show, which is an exhibition I did for years. I first started at La Luz de Jesus Gallery and then brought to my own Gallery 30 South in Pasadena and will now be featuring in, in um, Las Vegas here. So that's a Zachary Mendoza portrait of, um, of course, the author of The Great Gatsby, F. F. Scott Fitzgerald. A Lindsay Way piece from an exhibition I did with Lindsay, um, which is, features a piece of her high school notebook as the backdrop for drawings on top of it, which is kind of interesting. Of course, um, a forming member, or not a forming member, but a member of the classic lineup of the band Mime of Self-Indulgence. Beautiful Zoe Lakay tribute to uh, Japanese vampires and Japanese horror. 
And as a kid from Salem, Massachusetts, it's uh, always a beautiful thing to have a Veronica Fish, uh, uh, Sabrina, the Teenage Witch piece, and this a tribute to uh, Kiki's Delivery Service. Uh, this piece right here is a Dave Lebo portrait of Dexter, which is actually featured in Dexter in the season, I believe it's season five, in which um, Colin Hanks plays a painter who's also a serial killer. And this was featured on screen and popped into a couple of other pieces of art. I love it because it has that kind of famous monsters of Filmland look to it. And I just always love that original uh, Dexter series. Now the centerpiece of this whole wall is this wonderful piece by Christopher Ulrich. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Christopher Ulrich, he is a contemporary illustrator who very much has that kind of Gust of Dore style. Uh, his pencils are extraordinarily detailed. Um, his work is next level in terms of having elements of prior masterpieces worked into allegories. And um, I'm actually working with him on a comic series that I will uh, reveal later. Down here you have a Danny Shinya Luo piece from one of the exhibitions that I curated for her. Uh, Danny, of course, is known to most Marvel fans as uh, the artist who helped to reboot X-23 in her first ongoing series and did the covers of the first three issues. And that piece is a Hunter Jackson uh, production art piece for a Guar video. Hunter Jackson is one of the forming members of Guar, and so as a collector of not just comic art but production art, I thought it was important to have a piece of, um, of actual continuity artwork. And so that's from a video that Guar did that actually won a Grammy for um, Best Heavy Metal, Hard Rock Heavy Metal Video. Here, of course, you have the great Joe Coleman. Uh, this is a piece from his very first printed comic book art uh, story. And uh, it's um, a story about a, a murderer, uh, not quite a serial killer, but someone in that, that sort of same lane as sort of a spree shooter. And um, just a wonderful, wonderful piece. I've known Joe Coleman um, since I was a teenager back in Boston. And I'm just really, really happy to have this piece in my collection. Um, you know, he's considered a fine artist internationally, globally. And this piece, for people who are familiar with Zoe Milk, is from her very first exhibition. Um, I gave her her first featured show uh, when I was the gallery director at La Luz de Jesus in Los Angeles. And uh, the model in the piece is actually um, a a friend of mine who became my assistant for quite a few years, also a very talented uh, designer in her own right. Here we have another Christopher Ulrich piece. This is from uh, his exhibition at Billy Shire Fine Arts, which is called The Fourth Enochian Key. Um, a lot of rabbits you may see, um, and I have an affinity for um, rabbits as a sort of Loki character throughout um, mythology. And, um, you know, that is just the creepiest, craziest looking rabbit you're ever likely to see. And these next two pieces are both by Jose um, Rodolfo Loaiza Ontiveros. Uh, he does a Disney mashup art where he takes contemporary themes and does them in a Disney style. Never in sort of the way that Wally Wood had done a kind of crude... Uh, depiction of Disney in uh, the early undergrounds, but in a way that brings inclusion back into the whole Disney mythos. Um, he's an artist from, from Monterey, Mexico, and loves Disney. Uh, we sold a lot of his artwork, um, myself as curator, and he is an artist and um, doing commission pieces for people who work at Disney, for Disney lawyers, for Disney producers, for directors, for stars. Um, he became very famous when a piece of his work was retweeted by the wife of a famous director who was having an affair with the starlet and it got one of the first mimetic um, sort of levels of attention in early Instagram. One of the very first pieces to go literally viral. And that was a commission that I um, hired uh, Rodolfo to do because I figure really all Prince Charmings are Pinocchios. So having a, a, a mashup of Pinocchio and Snow White, my two favorite Disney films made a lot of sense. While there are a few pieces by other artists, this is my Bruno Redondo wall. 
So a uh, tribute to Nightwing, um, who of course is Dick Grayson, who was of course the original Robin, and my favorite comic book character of all time. I sort of feel like we're all Robin. We're all young men trying to come out of the shadow of our fathers as we get older, and nowhere has that been depicted better in comics than in the story of Dick Grayson and Bruce Wayne. And so that top piece there, of course, a, a cover to the Tom Taylor and Bruno Redondo Nightwing, is the first cover to feature uh, Nightwing's uh, illicit half-sister, um, the first cover to feature Bitewing, his three-legged dog, and um, one of the first covers to feature uh, his new costume, I believe, is the second cover. But the Melinda Zuko character is one of the very prominent new additions to the Tom Taylor writing of Nightwing, and a character that I absolutely adore. I also love that that cover has, in the top left corner, a retelling of the origin of the death of the Flying Graysons. And as you go across this row, you see, of course, another beautiful Nightwing cover by Bruno Redondo. And then as you get over a little bit further, you're going to see the very first appearance in comics, first full page appearance of Heartless, who is uh, to Nightwing what the Joker is to Batman. And then this is one of the few pieces that isn't uh, Redondo on this wall. It is a Jorge Jimenez cover to the Super Sons Annual One, which I love not only because it's Damian Wayne and John Kent, but because it has the Bat Hound and Crypto. And I'm a huge fan of Crypto the Super Dog. I love super powered pets. Um, I, I think that they're just incredibly underutilized characters. And this is just one of the all time great um, covers to capture the folly of youth as superheroes and then just the, the wonder of pets. And speaking of John Kent, uh, this is a beautiful, I believe, page one or title page uh, from Action Comics. Uh, this piece is by the incredibly and exceptionally talented um, Tyler Kirkham. Uh, you've got John Kent as a preteen. Um, you've got... Um, you know, Clark Kent in his sort of black Superman costume with the beard and everything. You've got a reference to social media. It is just a perfect, in my opinion, um, splash page of the modern era featuring everything and all the tropes of the era in which it was created. I love this version of John Kent. I was not a fan of them aging him up um, and wish they kind of kept him around here so we could really experience that same thing that we missed in the telling of the Dick Grayson story with, with Batman and the Batman and Detective Comics in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Um, but um, just a beautiful page from an uh, all-too-rare uh, pencil page by Tyler Kirkham in action. And then right here, of course, you have the very first cover featuring Heartless and Nightwing. And this piece is amazing. Um, you know, before... Tyler and Redondo were on Nightwing. They really kind of cut their bones, to speak, on Suicide Squad. And this cover with Batman was done in two pieces. The actual cover has the Suicide Squad sort of superimposed on the bottom. Uh, but this amazing image of Batman is one of the great images of Batman, I think, of the past decade. And just, like, incredibly haunting. Captures every element of why criminals would be absolutely petrified to experience uh, Batman in a dark alley or even in direct sunlight. And this right here is, of course, another Nightwing cover by Redondo, a uh, part of Tom Tyler's run. This is the, um, the new uniform, the very first appearance of the most up-to-date Nightwing um, costume um, uniform um, from their run and just a really iconic cover. Uh, Nightwing ran um, top to bottom, um, sideways, down the right side of the page and the printed version of the comic book. Now, when talking about the Taylor and uh, Redondo run on Nightwing, you have to talk about this amazing use of motion and overlapping motion that Redondo uses. Um, I know there's an Italian artist who uh, worked on similar overlapping themes in the 1970s, but I sort of feel that Redondo's use goes back to Winsor McKay and how Winsor McKay would use overlapping motion feature in his earliest comics. Of course, um, Little Nemo being the, um, the operative example and earliest example. 
but what a beautiful cover. It would trailer what would come in the very next issue, which would win the Eisner Award for Best Single Issue. Now, this cover here is the variant cover of that issue that won the Eisner Award. But um, otherwise, from the cover to the last page, it is one single panel that can be told across 20, 22 pages plus the cover in um, a constant action, constant motion scenario. Just a beautiful, beautiful piece of modern pop art. Now, one other thing that is very important in telling the story of uh, Dick Grayson and becoming his own man as Nightwing is the city of Bloodhaven. Uh, Bloodhaven is Dick Grayson's Gotham, um, most comparable to, say, modern-day Detroit. And here you see him on a rooftop kind of uh, looking over the city that he keeps safe. And I just think it's a, an amazing title page from just one of the best runs of the modern era in comics. And this is the most recent acquisition uh, I've had from, from Bruno. Um, this is a title page from a very recent issue of Nightwing. Uh, you obviously see uh, Dick Grayson from a really cool angle. It's very Steranko-ish in its own way, um, where you see uh, the angle upwards towards his face. And just, you know, again, beautiful use of black, beautiful use of negative space, and another piece from just an incredible comic series. Now, most of you will be familiar with this piece because uh, it was purchased on Comic Art Live. Um, this is, uh, of course, Ryan Sook and a beautiful Batgirl piece. If uh, Dick Grayson is my absolute favorite character, then my absolute number two is Barbara Gordon as Batgirl. And when I saw this, I knew I had to have it. I knew it would be raising money for charity. So I definitely paid above what the going rate might normally be for a Ryan Sook um, you know, non-published piece. But the dynamism of this and the beautiful uh, contrast it just made an absolute must-have. Uh, the holster that it is in is my custom uh, slab. I've got my own Pop Sequentialism logo on these. And, um, you know, I only use them for the pieces that I myself um, put into the slabs. And this is an actual full comic book, uh, a sketch cover by, um, you know the mega talented, um, you know, Fornes, you know, who has done some incredible work with Batman, but uh, also did work on DC's reboot of Rorschach, um, you know, when they did the After the Watchmen series. And, you know, I think when talking about Jorge Fornes, you want that very simple thing. It actually continues on to the back of the comic, um, but this is just such a great primary image, very reminiscent not only of Frank Miller's Dark Knight, but also of Mazzucchelli's Year One, which is obviously one of my favorite things. And we're better to end on a wall full of Dick Grayson than with uh, a Robin portrait from uh, George Perez. I uh, got this from George at Comic-Con, I believe it was back in 2013. Um, he was doing sketches for the Hero Initiative. This is actually a Hero Initiative card. Um, he didn't do it on the Hero Initiative printed side, which is on the reverse. Um, but that is the back of the card, which also places where it was done. Um, he was accepting $20 for little sketches. And I was like, George, I can't just give you 20 bucks. I need to give you 100. And so he said, oh, give me one of those other bigger pieces and, and decided to do it on a comic book size board. And I just absolutely love this. Um, of course, we all miss George Perez. Uh, his new Teen Titans run was just an incredibly important thing just in the history of my life and the way that I collected comics and my appreciation of the classic characters and sidekicks of the Golden Age to the point that I even contributed a little bit to Steve Bissett's book on sidekicks um, within the same era. And that right there is uh, just pure nostalgia. Um, I grew up in the city of Lynn, Massachusetts, which is, of course, the next street, the next city over from Salem. And this is from a local high school production at Lynn Classical High School um, of The Wizard of Oz. And I remember um, I'm the youngest of six, and my oldest sister was actually selling tickets for this, even though she didn't go to classical. She went to Lynn English. Uh, but one of her best friends was in the play, and I believe the high schools at that time had a shared drama department because budgets were so low in the 1970s. And so I remember there being a little booth on the front lawn of the house I grew up in selling tickets for this production. And um, a former business partner of mine, uh, a really, really cool guy, 
named Jordan, who a uh, huge Tiki collector, huge Beatles collector, uh, found this online and uh, gave it to me as a, a birthday present one year. And um, you know, someone that I worked with extensively in doing some exhibitions on arcade games and um, airline art and those types of things. Uh, you can follow him at Peekaboo, uh, who do a lot of amazing, nostalgic, um, sort of, um, for lack of a better word, um, you know, tchotchkes. But um, just a really, really thoughtful present. I've always appreciated it, and I knew I wanted to hang it in my office. You're still here? It's over. Go home.